Right. So where do I start from? Um, I think the first bit I'll probably start from is this is likely going to be a 30 minutes class maximum. Um, um, and so that's the first bit. <laughs> the second bit is this title is quite deceptive. Um, we are actually not doing, I think I kind of wrote it here. So we're, we're not doing modeling itself, right? Uh, we're not doing modeling per se, but we're just looking at ways to get enough data to, to actually kick off modeling work, right? So we'll go through some sample data sets that the, the major objective, similar to where the other chapters that we've done, the major objective here is can we get to a tidy enough data for us to actually kick off any other kind of modeling work that we want to overlay here? Um, and what this chapter is trying to preach is two, two, more, two more packages or two more functions that we can actually use to get to that tidy data itself, right? Um, so I'll kick off. Um, I, the, the other reason why I'm saying this is going to be like a 30 minute section is I haven't finished this chapter. I think I probably got to like, half of the chat itself, um, but we'll, we'll see, see where we actually end up, All right? So let me start from the very beginning. So in this chapter, there are three, three ideas that we're, that we're going to learn, right? The first one is how we can understand complex data sets. So like by complex data sets, it means, imagine a data set where every possible colon that you have it's important for whatever prediction you want to do, so like a multivariable prediction or something like that. But how can we actually use simple models to actually understand that complex data set? Right. Uh, it could also be in terms of the size of the data itself, right? So the, the, the amount of information that you can actually generate from that data. The other thing we are going to learn is the concept of least colons, right? And how they can store data structure in a data frame, right? And I guess this part is one of the biggest points in this chapter itself, the data structure that we are actually using that makes things a lot simple, right? Um, the final thing is the broom package, right? So how this broom package can easily get us to um, um, fully understand the prediction that we're actually doing here. And, and the idea of the broom, broom package is um, if you think about residuals on every other kind of calculated number that gives you an idea of if your prediction is working or not. That's what is covered under this Brown package, right? Now, the good thing here is this package, as opposed to how we have been doing in the previous chapter where we slice and dice things, this package allows you work with large data sets, like large number of models um, uh, uh, itself, right? And we can apply whatever technique that we learn from the beginning of this book a lot easier, right? So let's start from the very beginning. So we we'll start with a data set about life expectancy, right? Around the world, right? So it's a small data set, but it illustrates how important modeling can be for improving your visualizations, right? So we use a large number of simple models to partition out some of the strongest signals that we are, so we can see the subtlest signals that remain. So from our previous chapter, we learned that um, one of the ways that we can actually partition out these strong signals is by using what we call residuals, right? So we'll learn that a bit more in this chapter, but also go into a bit more detail of other values that we can actually use with this Bloom package, right? Um, so there are five major sections in this book, in this chapter rather. Uh, you have the gap minder, you have list colons, then creating list colons, then simplifying them, then making tidy data with Broom, right? The other thing I think is also important to flag is um, uh, the chapter is quite aspirational. So for someone like me that this is like my first introduction to R, um, this chapter is obviously a struggle, right? Because there are a number of concepts you kind of have to master for you to fully grasp what the chapter is teaching you. Um, and two big concepts are, in fact, the first one is data structures itself. So understanding difference between a data frame and a list and, and, and factors and things like that. Then also understanding modeling, right? Like, like the entire modeling process itself. Then the final bit is iterating on that model itself. So if I, if I lock down the data structure I want to use, 
How do I create data, data structure from scratch? How do I use existing data structures? How do I simplify them? How do I merge data structures in itself? How do I use that to model? And how do I use that to iterate? Right. So you kind of have to figure out this three concept first before this chapter will kind of make sense. So I kind of realized that chapters like this are fall under my bucket of things that you kind of have to do and redo, like read and redo, read, read for you to kind of figure out what you're saying. So let's start from the very beginning, prerequisites, right? Our normal, normal friends, we we uh, run these two packages, model R and tidyverse. Then let's now start with Gapminder, right? So he says, to motivate the power of simple models, we are going to look into the Gapminder data, right? Now this data was popularized by Hans Roslin, um, a Swedish doctor who unfortunately has died, uh, but was an interesting statistician and he actually left a very nice video that we can actually work for how he actually works through his process itself. He's also a very, very nice speaker. Um, someone that is quite interesting to, to listen to, right? So this gap minder data summarizes the progression of countries looking at that life expectancy and GDP. So, the, so whatever it's that we're trying to aim at, right? Um, and th that is summarized in this gap minder data and it was created by Jenny Bryan. So let's load this gap minder data and we can and we can easily see it, right? So you can see it's a table, 874 rows, six columns. So these are the six columns, country, the continent, the year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita, right? Now in this, in this study, we are going to focus on three variables to answer the question, how does life expectancy change over time for each country? Now, like I said in the last class, um going through this entire model piece in this r4ds book it heavily depends on the initial question that you actually want to answer right so you can easily see that from these data sets that we have there's a lot of things that you can actually hypothesize here right but we have, we have a very clear question that we're, that we're aiming for here right so we are looking at life expectancy we're looking at the year in terms of like trend or the life expectancy itself and we're looking at the country Right. Then we'll see how the continent plays a role in this entire thought process that we are aiming for. I would also see how population at some point, like qualitatively, how it plays a role. Then perhaps GDP per capita, now it also plays a role qualitatively in the thought process. But when we get to the, towards the end. Right. So let's visualize this gap mind that itself. And I guess one more thing I also want to flag is the idea of using this alpha. Right. So one of the things I figured out was. So data sets like this that are quite a lot, 874, sorry, 1,704 rows. Um, obviously, if you are creating a line, it's going to be a number of lines. And some lines would obviously overlap because we are doing a trend, trend analysis. The idea of this alpha is for you to have uh, this thick kind of lines. So you, you see these thick black lines that are seen in different portions in this visualization. It, it represents data that are overlaying on, on each other itself, right? And I realized that alpha kind of helps you represent the transparency of the data that you're aiming for itself, right? So I wanted to push that out because I think we'll probably see that as we actually go forward, especially in data sets that are quite a bit. And obviously they are, they are going to overlap, right? So visualizing this, we can, we can see some level of trend, you know, somewhat. So we're starting from 1950, um, all the way to past 2000s. We can see some level of trend that as the year increases, life expectancy somewhat goes up. Obviously there are some deviation. So I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but you can see between 1990 and 2000, there are some lines that trend downwards, right? So those, those deviate a bit from like the immediate um, um, upward trend line that we can actually see here. Now, the interesting thing here is, this is a small data set, especially because we're looking at those three variables, right? So the year, let me explain saying we're grouping it by country, right? But it's still quite hard for you to see what's going on. Now, overall, life expectancy has been steadily improving, right? But if you look closely, you can actually see some countries that don't follow this pattern. So each of these lines represents a country itself, and you can see that some, some lines are kind of deviating itself. Now, how can we make those countries easier to see? The first point here is this where the idea around uh, what, what we have been discussing in our previous chapters coming. Number one is filtering. Number two is creating residual, right? So how, how can we make some those countries that are deviating a lot easier to see? 
Now, the first thing here is to use the same approach as we used in last chapter. We can see that there's some, some level of linear, linear, linearity that is going on here, right? Uh, that makes it harder for you to see subtler trends. So we can bring out these factors uh, by, by fitting the model with a linear trend, right? So let's, let's try to do that. This model captures steady growth over time, but the residuals will show what's left, right? So let's try to figure this part out, this, this entire stretch here, using just one country, using New Zealand, right? So we create an object, we filter, and our data, we filter for the country New Zealand, right? We, we visualize New Zealand by piping it through ggplot, and we want to see, we title it full data, right? So that's our first bit. That represents what this will be. This represents the actual position, right? So for New Zealand, I can see a clear, a clear upward trend, right? So that's the first bit. The second bit is, let's create another object that is called New Zealand model. In this, in this object, we are now creating a prediction and visualizing it. That's, that's what we can see in this street line. So our prediction is, you know, there's a kind of constant gradient that's kind of going on in this, in this data set itself. The final thing that we want to create is, can we actually visualize the, the residuals that are here? So we add residuals for these objects that we have created and we visualize it with ggplot, right? So color white, size three, you can now see what this remaining pattern looks like. And so you can see that for the, for the modeling that we're doing, we are over predicting some and under predicting some itself, right? Now, this entire work, this entire track of work that we just did is just for one country, right? And if you go back up here, obviously there are a lot of countries that are here. So how can we do all this to every country? Now, this is the first part around getting to, to a tidy data. I, I think I put a comment here, right? So we will learn about the idea around nesting and unnesting. Now, the major idea here is just to summarize your data. You are just trying to figure out how you can summarize the data sets. Uh, the unnesting kind of allows you to visualize it. Obviously, when you summarize it, it kind of condenses everything. Visualization becomes quite difficult. So now you have to unnest for us to kind of get to a proper position. But we learn about unnesting as we go as we go forward. So let's start from nested data. Now, the the longer routes could be since we want to figure out for each country, we can just keep replicating this code itself, copy pasting, changing the country. But like you can see, there are quite a number of countries that are here. So even if we have replicated values for the country, right? There's just quite a number for us to for us to figure out here, right? And that's where we come to the idea around. You can imagine copy pasting this code multiple times. So this code that is up here multiple times, uh, but you've already learned a better way, right? You can extract out the common code with the function and repeat using a map function itself from Perl. So this is the very first package that we're trying to figure out, right? Right, so this problem is structured a little differently from what we have seen before. Now, instead of repeating an action for each variable, we want to repeat an action for each country, a subset of rows. To do that, we need to use a new data structure called nested data frame, right? So the idea of a data frame is uh, uh, a, like an Excel spreadsheet that you can only have one type of variable in. So in this case, let's say like a numerical variable, things like that, right? That's, that's my idea of what I think a data frame should be. Um, so to create a nested data frame, we start with a grouped data frame, then we nest it. Uh, so let's go one by one. I think I left a comment here. Right, so everything we're about to do here is very similar to the ranking process itself. So like trying to condense your data, but the key process here is that nesting function itself. So we create by country, our guide mind that data, we pipe it through group by, so we are, we are creating a group data frame then we now nest it. So group it by country and continent, then nest it. So now you see that if you, if you look at this by country object that we've created, we now have this colon that is called data and has the definition of the, the table dimensions, right? So 12 rows, four columns, 12 rows, four columns, things like that, right? 
The other thing we also see is we don't have repeated values of the country. So literally everything has been condensed itself, right? So it says this creates a data frame that has one row per group per country and an unusual colon called data. So data is a list of data frames or tables. And this seems like a crazy idea. We have a data frame with the colon that is a list and other data frames, right? Now, obviously in this statement, there's a lot of um, data structures that are being flagged in here. We would explain shortly why this is a good idea. Now, the data frame is a little tricky to look at because it's, it's a complicated list, right? And we are still working on good tools to explore these objects. Now, unfortunately, string is not recommended as it will often produce very long outputs. I, I don't think we actually see what this represents itself, but let's, let's just go on. Um, but if we pluck out a single element from the data colon, you can see that it contains all the possible data for that country. So let's try to um, let's try to subset data from our full data our full data set of using this dollar sign subset one. Now you can see that it actually has all the information that we are we are still aiming for, and all this piece of information itself, as explained by this table dimension, is covered in this column, as explained by this table dimension. Right. Now you can note the difference between a standard grouped data frame and a nested data frame, right? In a, in a group data frame, each row is an observation. In a nested data frame, each row is a group. Right? Another way to think about nested data sets is we now have a meta observation, a row that represents complete time course for a country rather than a single point in time, right? So let's go to the second concept. So we've, we've talked about nesting. This concept is now about least colons. So now that we have our nested data frame, right, what we have here, we are now in a good position to fit some models, right? So let's let's try to you know create a model here, a linear model here, um, uh, by creating a function, right? So a function df. I think we had created this in our previous chapter. A function df. Um, uh, we run it through this linear linear model function, um, the x-axis, uh, sorry, the y-axis and the x-axis um, uh, data set is df, right? So now we want to apply this to, to every data frame. Data frames are in a list, so we can use POMAP to apply country model to each element, right? So you can see how it's a lot easier for us to actually apply this using Perl as opposed to having to do this entire you know, one after the other. Right? So as soon as we do this, um, it goes into a bit more detail that if we leave this list of models as a free flowing object, like rather than leaving them as if, as if this list of models as a free flowing object, free floating object, it's better to store it as a colon in the by country data frame itself, right? So instead of leaving it as a free flowing object, so like, so leaving it this way, it's probably better if we can actually store it in the by country column itself. And we'll probably see how that goes. Right now, storing related objects in the column is a key part of the value of the data frames and why I think these columns are such a good idea. Right. Um, um, let me just finish this entire piece. So I, I, don't, I think I, I don't want to rush this bit again itself. So I think there's a lot of interesting things that was being flagged. Um, from this part going down. So it says storing related objects in colon is a key part of the value of data frames, right? Um, and why I think list colons are such a good idea. In the course of working with these countries, we are going to have a lot of lists where we have one element by a country. Um, so why not store all of them together in one data frame? In other words, instead of creating a new object in the global environment, so instead of creating this new object, Right, we are going to create a new variable, right? A new colon in the by country data frame itself. And we can do that using dplyr right? So essentially, rather than stopping here, we can go one step further by creating um, uh, a colon, which will be represented here. So that colon, we start from our, our initial objects by country, we pipe the history mutate. Um, uh, uh, then we now do the modeling work that we want to do here. So essentially, 
mutate just allows you to create a colon itself, and that's now represented in this in this variable. Right. So this has a big advantage because all related objects are stored together. You don't need to manually keep them in sync when you filter a range. The semantics of data frame takes care of that for you. Right. So it just goes into a bit of context for why creating these list colons kind of makes a bit more sense. It's a lot easier for you to now pull pull out information if you want to. Right. So by country, you can filter out by Europe, right? And it can show you everything you want to see. You can actually arrange it by country and continent and show you everything you want to see and things like that. Right. So if your list of data frames and list of models were separate objects, you will have to remember that whenever you reorder or subset one vector, you need to reorder and subset all the others in order to keep them in sync. If you forget, if you forget, your code will continue to work for it to give wrong answer. So I think this is actually quite important. Right. So we've talked about nesting. The entire idea is just very similar to the idea around wrangling. Trying to summarize a piece of data here for us to actually have something a bit tidy um, and a bit easier for us to actually interpret. Um, but obviously, when we want to visualize, uh, now we have to spread out the information that is reflected in each of these variables itself. And that's what honesting is about, right? So it says, previously we computed the residuals of a single model with single data sets. Now we have 142 data frames and 142 models. Right? Um, to compute the residuals, we need to add, call add residuals with each model pair. Okay? So, so this kind of goes into a bit more, a bit more stretch about what we are aiming for. Um, in this chapter. So like we said, we are trying to aim for a tidy data uh, and to get to like a proper model of fits. One way to do that come, you know, based on everything we have been learning from the previous chapters, um, from the previous modeling chapter has been around creating the residual. Okay. So we do exactly the same thing. The by country objects we had created, we mutate that, then now create a new colon for receipts, right? Um, and we map that to you know this information also. Okay. So you can also see that reflected here. And now we have receipts, right? But how can you plot this list of data frames? Like instead of struggling to answer this question, I'm, I'm guessing there are ways that you can actually do it because I mean, it's still a, it's, it's still a data set in itself. But instead of going through that stretch of having to figure that out, why don't you just unnest, right? So previously we had used nest to turn a regular data frame into a nested data frame. Now we do exactly the opposite with honest, right? So this receipts that we had created, we honest it by, by country and the residual, right? So now if I run receipts, I can easily see um, uh, uh, the information set I'm aiming for here. So pretty much the same information I started out with is now condensed in this residual object uh, itself, right? Now each regular colon is repeated once, um, um, for each row in the nested colon, in the nested colon itself, right? Now that we have a regular data frame, now that we're back to regular data frame up here, uh, we can now plot these residuals that we have created. So we created these residuals with this add residuals, residuals itself, right? So let's plot this out, right? So residuals, ggplot, um, the y-axis, the x-axis, uh, we create a line, and see where the alpha now plays a role here. Now that we're visualizing a lot of over, overlapping lines itself. I think I left a comment here. Yeah, so alpha just shows how solid the line is, right? So 0 0.1 is very see true. Reason why we have one third here is so that we can see these lines on lines and it creates this dark pattern for us to identify that there are particular lines that are on top of each other, right? So the residuals clearly shows us here like what we are aiming for in terms of the prediction. You can still see that um, we have over predicted some, we have under predicted some. So there are still some information here that um, is still not going as we actually planned based on, or at least as we had hypothesized based on the, the straight line that we can see that this linear line that we can see that is trending upwards. There are still some, some countries that, that are obviously not following that pattern itself. Right at different points in the time trend, right? 
So we can obviously facet this entire DG plot here by continent, so it will be easier to see. We do that, we can see that the two continents are giving a lot of headaches, Africa and Asia, because they are the ones that have this spike uh, itself. Right. So it looks like we've missed some mild pattern. Um, there's something going on in Africa. So you can see that there's sort lot of huge variation that happens in Africa in the residuals column that we, that we created, right? Um, so we have very large residuals. We suggest that our model isn't fitting so well here. I would actually explore this in the next section as we actually go into a bit more to model quality, right? So I'll probably take a pause there and probably take a, take a step back here. So everything that we have learned from here going upwards has largely been uh, maybe two more steps from the other chapters that we have been talking about. But essentially, we've still talked about creating a tidy data. We've still talked about um, um, fitting a model. And we still talk about the best way to fit a model here is to create residuals, right? That's everything we've talked about so far. Everything we've discussed um, upwards here is how do we actually get to that tidy data and how do we actually use residuals to actually get us to a fitted model for itself. So now let's go into a bit more detail, right? So there are extra processes that we can do that can show us any other sense of model quality apart from residuals itself, right? So instead of looking at residuals, right? So there are general measurements that we can actually look at um, of model quality. And I remember when we were doing, I think when we started this entire model work itself, I had mentioned that, you know, I guess fig I figured that this part is probably going to be a lot friendly if you have concept of like linear regression and things like that. So because, you know, this model quality piece, I, I think kind of features a lot more for people that are doing predictive work. And you can also see that like, as soon as we overlay the broom package here, you can see that the, the variables that are used here as a thought process for this measurement of model quality have, you know, they're like linear regression model variables itself. So you can see R squared, yeah, just said R squared, the sigma statistic, the p-value, the, you know, the, uh, and, and things like that, so we kind of move forward, right? So to compute this general measurement of model quality, um, we, we cannot use the Broom package. So the Broom package provides a general set of functions that turn models into tidy data. Now we can use what we call the Broom, Broom, Broom glance function. So it extracts some model quality metrics. Let's give it a minute. Right, and if we apply it to a model, we get a data frame with just a single row. Right, so essentially the entire work that we have been created. Remember when we created this New Zealand model? I think that was somewhere up here when we created this New Zealand model. So this object that we created for us to get like to also add predictions itself. So we can now run this through the Broom the Broom glance function itself. And that is now represented, right? So you can see all other variables that kind of communicate um, um, model quality. So. so we can still use mutate and unnest to create a data frame with a row um, for each country. I think I'll soon get to where I ended uh, itself. Right. Um, so let's try to do that. So still our, our same object by country. We create a new colon called um, um, glass. Um, uh, and literally, we are just trying to create everything that we are doing up here. Right? We're trying to create a colon for it. Then we unnest it. Right? And we can see how everything is now figured out. Everything now has its own colons itself in this by country that are set. Right? Um, now, this isn't quite the output that we want. Let me see. Okay, so I'll come to that. So this, is, this isn't quite the output that we're actually looking for because it includes all the list columns. So that's these two, right? Um, but this is the default behavior when unnest works on single row data frame, right? So obviously the unnest that we created here was just used on a singular column here, right? So that's why it unnested a particular thing, right? Rather than, rather than all the other list columns or other nested data frames that we had. Right. So now, if you want it to do for every other ones, you have to create what we call a dot drop. Right. One of the things I think I learned from the previous court 
is that dot drop has actually been removed in the new version of the, of the book itself. So I think this part has actually been updated itself. But the, the point is, if you actually want to take a look at this um, uh, without every other extra kind of information, so like this, this listed, this listed data frames itself, you can actually move, put the drop on the get through. And now you can see that we only have um, the initial information that we had on by country. And now our glance, um, the, the glance column that we actually mutated to this, to this um, itself, right? So it says pay attention to the variables that are not printed. There's a lot of useful stuff here. So like these guys that are here. Right? So again, like I said, the entire idea of the Bloom package is just to show you um, um, generalized idea of model quality itself. So like literally all the, vari all the possible variables that can be used in like a linear regression uh, itself. Now, with this data frame that we have created in mind, we can now start to look for models that don't actually fit well, right? And one way to do that is, I guess the easiest way to do that is looking at your R squared, or in this case, your adjusted R squared itself. I mean, there's no point going to detail here. This is a bit more about just mathematical models and things like that. So I don't think that's the point of this, this um, course itself. So it's pretty clear that the worst models here appear to be in Africa. You can see that by the negatives, right? Um, so let's double check that with an actual plot. And here we have have its own observations with a discrete variable. So geom jita is actually quite effective. Right? So the number of observations that we have here is just 142 rows. So it's quite easy to, to do. So if we use ggplot, we view continent and the R squared, we can easily see what that deviation kind of looks like. Right? So it also says that as soon as we have gotten to this point, Right, so we go to this point where we have created our by country object. We figured out other variables of model quality. We can actually remove, um, um, we can actually remove rows or observations that actually have this bad quality itself, as as you know, as explained by the R squared or adjusted R squared that we're looking at. And one way we can do that is we create an object called bad fit. We filter out our data set or this colon itself for R squared that is less than 0.25, right? Um, and we now go back to our gap minder data sets that we started out with, right? And, and try to visualize that, right? So if you want to visualize the, the ones that actually have that bad fit itself by country, now we can actually see the countries that are actually contributing to this, to A, this deviation that we can see in Africa, B, this deviation that we can see in the generalized residual plot, then C, to this deviation that we can actually see in the broad gap my data set itself. Right? And we can see that there are six different countries. Now, based on the data sets that we're working with here, we're talking about life expectancy, GDP, and, you know, and how that has progressed over time. You can easily see that, uh, and this is where I said the GDP per capita is probably a very important metric to look at here. You can easily see that most of the countries here obviously have very low GDP per capita. So GDP per capita variable in, in economics to communicate countries that um, there are essentially low income generating countries, right, itself. And we can actually see that uh, these countries will fall under that bucket. The other part here is we can also hypothesize here that since we're looking at life, life expectancy, these countries have been the ones that have had the tragedy of HIV AIDS epidemic and also the Rwanda genocide itself. That's why Rwanda actually features here. And that's why you can see that Rwanda obviously has a very big spike in terms of the life expectancy itself, right? So we've done this entire dance and we've gotten to this stage. And like I said, the entire idea of, I think it's where I actually stopped. The entire idea of this chapter is not building the model itself is trying to combine the thought process that we had around why visualization is quite important in the modeling thought process, why we need to get to a tidy data before we actually do any kind of prediction, why residuals can actually be a good way for us to figure out what model quality looks like. Then finally, what other kind of metrics are we actually use to define our model quality itself, right? And based on all that thought process, we have figured out that there are actually six observations that we can actually pull out 
from our gap mind data assets that we started out with for us to get to what's best fit to family represent in itself. So that's where I, that's where I stopped. I think that should be closer to halfway of this book. Then we can probably continue from the remaining parts um, in our next in our next class. I hope everything I've said so far makes makes a bit of sense. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. Fantastic. So thank maybe you, some house, thank you, thank you. Some housekeeping rules. Um, so the book club had mentioned that there will, there will be no classes on 31st October and I think 7th November. Um, we don't actually have classes in those two periods itself. And the major reason is because of time differences. So they mentioned that uh, time zone is going to get crazy very fast in America. So it's very difficult for them to actually apportion Zoom channels. Um, it's, I think that's what, that's what the communication is. But the point here is, you know, time zone is going to be quite difficult. So there will be no class on those two periods. Um, we don't have um, classes on those days itself. So 30th October and um, 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 I think 7th November. Um, however, if we actually get to a, a place where things get quite difficult in these two periods itself. So 27th October and let's say 10th November, we can actually move those classes uh, itself to, to a different date. So, so that's, that's the only housekeeping rules I think I have. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you, see you next week. Cheers, bye.